Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, James, for the introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Alex uh, Hübner. Um, I'm a postdoc in Christina Warner's group um, and working mainly on uh, ancient and modern uh, human gut microbiome related samples. Um, and one of my pet projects over the last few months now has been genome assembly. And so I have the privilege today to actually show you, um, together with my uh, colleague Nikolai, um, who's helping me out, um, something about genome assembly. So before we jump in, I know, I, or I assume, I don't know, I assume that you already got a rough introduction of what genome assembly is by the lectures either this morning or one of these mornings that I was unfortunately able to join. However, to bring everyone up to speed, um, I want to give a very short introduction what I actually mean when I talk about genome assembly or in particular de novo genome assembly of metagenomic data. So, as you have heard and hopefully also now know, is that usually when we have an ancient DNA sample, then our samples that we sequence on the um, sequencing machine, sequencing platforms, are so-called metagenomic samples. What metagenomic means in this case is that we don't have a single source from which the DNA comes from, but we have multiple sources, microorganisms, the host organism, so if human samples human, if you have a goat, the goat, um, and so on, virus sequences, and, and so on. And uh, if you look now at my toy example, then you see that um, in this case, we have in this sample, three different sources which are color coded um, within. So we have red, yellow, and blue as a whole. And so far, if you now want to have the sample sequence and you would like to know what actually is in there, the way you, uh, what you can do is, is to go to the approach that Maxime showed yesterday with taxonomic profiling. You take the taxonomic profiler and then it will tell you, oh, you have X percent of bacterium A and uh, like Y percent of bacterium B and so on. However, if in your reference genome, this one, like one of these uh, species that is present in your sample is not represented. In this case, we see that only the blue uh, species and the red species are represented, the yellow isn't. You won't see actually the results, uh, any results for yellow. The only thing you see that a large fraction of the reads is not aligned. And um, the higher this number is, the fewer sample, like the worst, the worst fit is your database to what uh, you want to do. Till a few years ago, the only thing you could then do is to go back and go um, to like the example here drawn on the right hand side, where you would take your sample, you would try to cultivate it, um, isolate, like get an, um, a single isolate uh, out of from a clone, extract these, uh, the DNA from this clone and then do a single genome assembly where you know all the DNA comes from one organism, in this case, the red one. And as you know, ancient DNA is not really alive anymore, like more than samples, stool samples where you still can cultivate something, the DNA is broken down, cell walls are uh, porous, the cells have leaked, they are, have, are dead. So that is not really an option. So till for a few years, it was only possible to do go back to the left-hand side and hope that someone else uh, has already found your genome. However, in the year 2015, there was a kind of a technical revolution with respect to um, metagenome assembly because suddenly people programmed tools that allowed us to directly assemble metagenomes from metagenomic sequencing without trying to have like single sources or something coming out of it. And so therefore, today we will talk about this process, why is it cool, why, how to do it, what you can take out of it, and so on. Of course, we need a sample to, to play around with it, and I have picked a sample from a very cool study that um, your colleague here, Mohamed, was I think also uh, part of, from the published by Mike's et al. last year in current biology, where they, um, identified four paleofeces that were dated from the late Bronze Age to the uh, Mid-Iron Age, so roughly uh, 3,000 uh, or 2,000, like 3,000 years before present to nowadays. 
And one of they did a lot of variety of different analysis. If you want to read a very well done paper about what you can all do with um, ancient DNA samples, archaeological remains, that is a really great study. We focus today for our analysis on the youngest sample, which is the, has the numbered like ID 2612, which was um, originally thought to be uh, also an Iron Age sample, but after redating, it turned out to be actually only 300 years old and uh, part of the Baroque times when the mines were used. Um, we won't use for today's paper the whole sequencing data that the was produced for the sample in the study, because overall they sequence up to 250 uh, million reads. And the main issue is if we would do it, we would sit here for two days waiting for programs to finish running if we have a powerful cluster. So we instead work on a subsample that I prepared for this practical and um, do the work on this one. To work with the data, um, you could either download the data. So if you would like later to do this uh, analysis on your own computer, on your own clusters at your institutes where you're from, then you could go to the upper links. Or we have actually, I hope at least that this works uh, for everyone, the volume, like the data already present in the volume. So if you please follow me to your um, machines, um, you should see now my screen. Then we go to volume, volume 4C genome assembly. If we then there just do a simple as LS to list all files, then we see that we have the uh, aforementioned fastq files 2612 underscore r one dot fastqgc and the other um, read end 2612 underscore r two fastqc present. Does anyone have any issues uh, with having these? finding these files. I try to check also the chat. If anyone has a problem, please let us know in the chat. Otherwise, I assume everything, everyone has it set up and we don't have to worry about that part. The rest of the files that are in there will we need we will need later, and you can actually ignore them for the moment. All right. Um, the next step that we have to do is that we have to um, activate the Conda environment. Like this morning, we use the same Conda environment as this morning. So if you are already have activated the one that is called microbial genomics. Yeah, genomics. Then you don't have to do it, but I don't have yet. And so in the end, when this command is successful, you have, should have at the left-hand side of your new terminal line now in parentheses, microbiome-genomics written. If that doesn't work for anyone, again, please let us know during, in the chat window. All right, I assume that it worked for everyone. Um, so the next, um, the first step is we want to know um, how many uh, reads we actually have in the sample. So I told you that this is a subsample. I haven't told you how many reads you have yet. So that is the first task for today. You will see on the slide always something about an bold uppercase task, and then usually a hint if I want you to do a certain thing. But we will walk through it together, so um, that's more as also kind of more if you are a bit lost and want to, to figure out things. So to figure it out, we go now to, again, to our service um, instances, and there we type BioArc. BioArc is a program that is um, an extension of the um, Linux um, or Unix program Org, which uh, has, a sp or has been a special way of passing uh, fast and fast Q files, which we can activate with the function dash C fast X. And then we just have to write what actually Org is supposed to do. And in this case, we want just to 
At the very end, once it read the whole file, tell us how many records or rows um, it has in there, which we do by typing in single quotes, END, curly brackets, print, capital NR, curly brackets closed, and then the fastq file. We can then, once we have done that, just press enter. Um, nothing will happen for a second. And then a number appears. And since I would like to you to be a bit interactive, the whole thing, and um, that didn't turn out so well, or I saw that a few of you are very shy, both with having cameras on, plus like speaking up in the crowd, I took an example um, of uh, Maxime, and I would like you to all to um, go to this link that you will have pasted now here in the chat. And open this in your browsers. Um, this should provide you with a list of 12 questions, uh, hopefully, um, that you can then fill in regarding the results. And I will have a look and check what actually um, comes out at each of the questions. So I have, how many people on the chat room? 34, I have seven answers, 10 answers. So I'll give you a few more seconds. All right, so the vast majority, all but one, are uh, like chose one between one and five million reads. To be fair, I clicked this is for me, what this was also the correct answer. So if you would check what is correct, that is the, in this case, for a single file, the correct answer. But the the person that clicked on C is right. In theory, um, we have doubled, like we have two files, so we have two times three million reads, so in total six. So we can interpret this uh, also as between five and ten million reads, um, which is a nice example when you hear people speak about number of reads, number of DNA molecules. Um, some people use them synonymously. Some people say you have two reads per DNA molecule if you do paired in sequencing, like it's this case. So um, we, uh, yeah, you all got it right in a way. Um, so good start. More than 10 million reads, uh, no. Um, okay, now that we have done the, uh, the first quiz, I have to do a disclaimer to you. Um, a lot of the steps that we're running today or are supposed to be running and discussing today are very time consuming and memory intensive, which means it will either take so long that we would meet every three days to kind of discuss part of the results or we can't even run them at all in the cluster because you either have too little disk space, too little memory, you're not, the computers are not fast enough. In this case, I decided to skip the execution of these steps and provide you with the results. All the results files that you're supposed to run are, or almost all I have to say, I will come to the ones that are missing in a moment, are in your file folder that we are just working from. Uh, if you ever at home want to do it, you can download all these files also from the address below. However, whenever I, you see this kind of trolley, this delivery icon, that means for you, okay, there's code on the slide, so I still provide you with the code so in case you want to run it on your home servers by yourself. 
or your home institute servers by yourself. However, we will not run the commands, we will just take the results for it. For the rest of the commands, this is still a bit um, more complicated. So what we do is we will download the commands and paste them into the command line. I will share the link with you in the chat that you have to run in your terminals and then go to my own terminal and just download it here. In the end, you should have a message like this saying, oh, resolving share.eva.mpgde, which is our uh, local next cloud instance, connection, then the command file, which is only four kilobases, and then you have the command file saved. For the sake of efficiency, I would now highly recommend you all to press Control Shift T, which will open you a new tab in your browser, in your, um, in your terminal window. You can also manually achieve that, I think, by clicking, no, that was wrong. By going here to File and Open Tab. Once you have the tab open, you can go to less command.txt and you have all the commands that we will run today presently available to you so that you don't have to type them from the slides or worry about it they should be all uh, able to run you can only see the first steps we already passed like activate the uh, environment and uh, running bioorg on the files um, and so we will continue it's more or less a poor man's version of a Jupyter Notebook you have been uh, seen yesterday, but uh, unfortunately I didn't think about it earlier. Uh, I was um, thinking that you could copy directly from the slides that you are shared, which is not possible. And so you have to work with what all generations 25 years before you had to work with just simple text files. Sorry about that. All right. Having said this, we go one slide further and talk about the next step. So first step, usually after having your sequencing data downloaded is to prepare your sequencing data. And while I already did this for you, we still have kind of one thing you should always check um, when you have samples is something that is very fundamental for assembly, which is the DNA molecule length distribution. So what is the DNA, uh, DNA molecule length? So if you have a sequencing library and you um, that have pattern sequencing data, like you have seen here before, then the black part here in the middle is the insert or the part of the DNA molecule that you have built into the library with the adapter and index sequences necessary for sequencing on the outside. And then in the sequencing process, you start sequencing first the forward read, let's say it's 75 base pairs in, and then the reverse read, another 75 base pairs. And if you what you can do when based on the sequence, you take the sequences, you remove the adapter sequence, all the steps that you already learned that Eager does for you. Then you actually can um, ask yourself, did for a read pair, the forward read and the reverse read meet in the middle of it? So was the sequencing, like, a, did they have overlapping read pairs between them? If yes, then you sequence the whole DNA molecule and you can directly uh, infer the um, size otherwise you have a you know only that your dna molecule was larger than 140 base pairs in my example because 75 75 150 usually we need 10 base pairs or 11 base pairs of overlap so you end up with 140 base pairs at most why is this now important in the de novo assembly approach the assemblers are using the distance from forward and reverse reads to um, calibrate their um, algorithm to direct correctly infer the um, sequences, like the or reconstruct the sequences of the DNA molecule. On the right hand side, you have now an example from a, a DNA molecule length distribution that I took from the Orlando et al. paper from uh, 2013, where you see a 700,000 year old horse. Uh, it was from a horse bone um, that was uh, dated to 700,000 years, stayed in permafrost, so it was deep deeply frozen all the time 
And if you look at it, the uh, read length distribution um, or DNA molecule length distribution, you see you have a few short molecules that are just 35 base pairs, 40, but you have also quite a higher proportion of reads that are above 75, 80 base pairs. And if you see um, like a distribution like this, where most of the molecules are shifted to the right, I would say you have for an ancient DNA sample that is a well-preserved ancient DNA sample with almost no degradation. If you, the bump would be shifted far to the right, scoot to the right here to, to, uh, to the left, sorry, to the left on the left-hand side, then you would have a um, poorly preserved sample. We now want to do, infer the same thing um, for our sample. And for this, we use the program that Maxime already mentioned yesterday, FASTP, which allows us to efficiently overlap the read pairs and then produce us an insert site distribution. For this, we go to our server. In this case, um, you open, if you have not opened yet your command txt file, and you can copy the code for fastp, like I do now, and go to the other window where on the left-hand side, make sure this is the window where you have the microbiogenomics content environment activated, can paste the code and press enter. In this case, because we're not really interested in trimming, um, adapter sequencing, quality filtering, length filtering, I switched off all of this with um, this commands A dash A dash G dash Q dash L that deactivates everything. And the only thing I sell, please um, merge the reads, so overlap the reads that are um, can be overlapped and write everything um, out to send it out, but we're also not interested in fast skew fast, but I just want to have more or less the summary report that it produces. And you see already on your screen, hopefully by now, that it printed the same thing like I have here, read one before filtering, read two before filtering and so on there. And we um, uh, want to now investigate the um, report. For this, we go here on the left hand side to application and we open the web browser. Then a Firefox window should appear for all of you. And from the Firefox window, we write file report, col like colon, three dashes, and then volume, vol, volume, and then you go to 4C genome assembly. So more or less the path that you just have in your in the terminal as well. So by putting file colon dash um, dash dash, you more to say I have want to open my local file, not the web page. Like you have the HTTP colon dash dash uh, slash slash sorry, and then you just put the file path in. Here we see at the very bottom that there is now a file called overlaps HTML, which we can click on, and this is the summary of our. FASTQ report. And if we scroll down slowly, then at some point there's a, a histogram for the insert size um, uh, distribution where we see um, the sequence was sequenced two times 150 base pairs. So the maximum sequencing length is uh, somewhere between, uh, is, I think for default fast P requires 30 base pairs overlap. So around 270 base pairs is the maximum. 72 here at the bottom is, says is in there. The shortest part was 30 because everything else I filtered out. And this is the distribution. So. What do you take from this? And if we go to our practical, to the second question, do you, would you say this is a highly degraded ancient sample, a moderately degraded ancient sample, or a modern sample? And I would wait for answers.
Yeah, so Nikolai just pointed out if you want a shortcut and not use the clicking, you can directly start Firefox from the command line by typing uh, Firefox. So I see still a few answers triggering in. I would still jump to the conclusion that the majority of you uh, point out that it looks like a moderately degraded ancient sample, and that's correct. If we would have a, um, a very strongly degraded sample, we have, would have this spike we have here on the left-hand side of this extremely degraded short read data. But since the majority of the reads are, are have a length of above 80 base pairs, um, it's a moderately degraded one, even if you see that 40% of the read data can't is even longer than the um, 272 base pairs, one can even argue that it's almost like a modern sample, which also makes sense because the um, sample itself is relatively young. It's only 300 base years old and the storage conditions, if you've ever been here in a salt mine, is usually moist. It's like a moist fridge um, at if, like six or seven degrees throughout a year. So they have, the sample are preserved like in a, in a fridge over 300 years. Um, so that's more or less the outcome of that. All right. We can close the um, fire. Uh, We can close the, the terminal. I accidentally, of course, deleted my uh, tab, so I have to activate the environment. Sorry about that. And we go to the next step. So now we actually come to the uh, de novo assembly itself, and we use for the de novo assembly the program MegaHit. MegaHit is a so-called deploying graph assembler. Um, I will not go into detail what a deploying graph assembler is because I have just to admit I would do a horrible job to explain to you a deploying graph. If you're really curious um, to ever know about uh, know about these things, there's a lot of great YouTube videos by people much smarter than me that can explain it at least. I will show you the Brian graph in a moment that you get an idea, but bear with me. Um, and what it does actually for the assembly, it doesn't use the reads itself, but it uses so-called k-mers. And the k-mers are then inferred from um, the DNA sequences, and these k-mers have different lengths. What do I mean with k-mers? In this example here, we have a DNA sequence, um, A, C, G, A, G, G, T, A, C, G, A. And we have a, the k-mer, um, inference for this one with a length of four. So k of four means we have four bases long. So the first four bases are A, C, G, A. Next ones are C, G, A, G, G, A, G, 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 and so on. And this is done throughout all the reads that you have in a very fast manner. And then what the program does, it does accounting. And so if we look at this, um, our example here, then the first kmer appears here in the first line and the first row in the uh, bottom row. So you have this kmer is like found twice and all the other ones are found a single time. And that's more or less what MegaHit does. And then using this deploying graph tries to reconstruct your um, context sequences. And all of these deploying graph assembler work in a very similar way. However, why do we then use MegaHit? So one of the reasons is 
if you have work in an institute that doesn't have a great uh, IT infrastructure with big servers, Megahit has a very low memory footprint. So compared to the other ones, you can run it on a relatively small machine. For some examples, even your uh, a bit better equipped laptop would work well. Second part is we realized in testing in our group, the Warner's group, that Megahit is the only program that works very well if you have also ancient DNA damage present at high frequency. So for a lot of other samples, um, it, uh, other assemblers, this would not work properly and you get poorer results. Soon you will, like this is still internal knowledge, we are at the moment uh, in a well school that you have my, our metering round table will present tomorrow and I are trying to finish the publication for that. So at some point you will also have proof for that. At the moment you have to believe me for that. And lastly, we are also able to use single end data, which um, is particularly useful because a lot of the samples were that we work with on a sequence or for multiple purposes, also for human DNA in some uh, circumstances. And usually particular human population geneticists prefer for ancient DNA samples to sequence them single end. And Megahead is the only program that allows single end data assembly as well. There are a number of other programs, for example, Metaspace, MetaHipmer. If you want to have um, a look about them, you can go to this um, Kami Challenge paper. So the Kami Challenge is a critical assessment of the quality of different assemblers and binning programs. They have a long list of things. Uh, so you have to, the only thing you have to take into account is in this, for modern data, mega hits actually performs worse than the other assemblers, but because of the reasons above, because it performs, seems to perform better on ancient data, we prefer to use it anyway for our set. Yeah, so Maria asked about the adapters. If FastP can also trim adapters. I skipped this part because the data was already adapter trimmed um, before. Um, usually when you download data from Ina, you have to remove adapters. Otherwise, Ina says, please do like send us the data again, adapter removed. You should always still run adapter removal on downloaded data just to make sure that it was done correctly. In this case, the data was pre-prepared. That's why I skipped the part and there's no adapters present in the data set. Okay, next step is we do the actually the novel assembly. For this, we switch um, in the terminal, the question that I'm asked want you to answer is which camera length were actually selected by Mega. So keep that in mind. So we go over to the server. We go to our um, uh, to our commands line uh, command uh, text file. We can copy it. Okay, what did I do? click now? Hmm. Um, I don't know. No, this was wrong. Wait a second. I will quickly. Hmm. Interesting. Try control shift oh, also. Okay, that was wrong. So let's go over to this one once more. So we copy the command with mega hits. Sorry about the confusion. I don't know what I clicked and pressed and uh, stuff like this. And then we run it. As a first step, what you see now on the screen is that the 
Megahit converts the actually text sequences of the FASTQ file into a binary version of itself. And then it starts um, the assembly. And you see then always which like cameras are used by the output of the, um, of the program. Uh, and so that takes now a while. If you have a large enough file, it might take a few hours. In our case, it will take a few minutes, but we just take the time. Alex, excuse me, uh, David is asking an interesting yeah. question. Uh, what can be the reason for having multiple peaks at the um, insert um, length distribution? Um, I believe we, oh. we've seen two uh, distributions, one from the Orlando's paper and the other one that we computed. Could you please answer Yeah, so there's, this? there's multiple... Um, yeah, sorry, I sorry, David. Uh, David, I didn't. My my Garvey Town screen has one size five or something on this big screen, so I'm a bit hard to read. Sorry. And the reason for that is that I actually concatenated all different sequencing runs, and their screening sequencing run was run on different um, with a different uh, nominal sequencing length than um, their main sequencing run. So if you, for example, now have a read where you have that is you sequence two times seventy five then you will have a, um, your normal distribution, but you will expect that you have a peak at 75 base pairs if you keep all the reads where one of the mates um, passed the quality check and the other one failed in there. Because then you have, can't merge anything, you can't infer the real size, so you just keep the, the real length and that's 75 base pairs and you get a peak. And quite often, because of these uh, different normal sequencing, they also for the Orlando paper. Can go back actually for, to the slide now, so that people know what I'm talking about. So here, for example, where you say um, 95 base pairs or something, it is very likely the sequence two times 96 base pairs, which was on the old uh, genome analyzer two platform that they used at the time, a common thing. So they, that is very likely the, the first peak. They might also have sequenced something shorter. That's why they have it. But usually this over-representation means just that you have a different um, normal sequencing then, or you have a certain um, pattern of merging that you have, a, like if you have a lot of phi x, for example, in there, and all your phi x reads have a certain quality, they cut off, and they uh, are shorter than what you actually read, like your reading distribution for the rest is, you might also end up so seeing it here, if Pikes was not sufficiently removed or something like this. So that is the, hopefully answers your question. So um, mainly a technical reason rather than a biological one. All right. That is one step too far. In the meantime, like machine is still running. We see now the different um, steps that it's taking um, for the assembly. And once it's done, you can then start to submit in a free test form. which KMR lengths were done. So just write the number, comma, number, comma, number, comma, and I will have a uh, look then here. If everyone asks himself, why is Alex looking quite, like more and more red in the face and starts kind of melting, it's outside 36 degrees and in the room we are, there is no air conditioning. So, uh, sorry about that. I mean, you just like, like there's more, for instance, more photogenic than today. For Megahit, do you now uh, again put the ML in? Um, that's a good point. I, you can, in theory, do uh, merge gym data, but um, because, like I said before, um, 
in the internal model, the insert size um, inference is, can also like use more or less the read length um, as insert size distribution. But from testing, we have uh, um, found that it slightly performs better on the same data set if you actually keep this separate. So therefore, I usually run the collapse for things that I need the the reads with fast speed instead of doing running adaptive movement twice. But in the meantime, at least for me, it now finished. So all the um, assembly is done. At the bottom, you get an overview, number of contexts, total length pair, and so on. And you can go on to answer. the question that I posted here, which already quite a number of people do. So yeah, I think all of you, except for whoever puts 500 and 140 in there um, is correct. The 21 and 29 uh, is partially correct. You can in theory go through the list here and check, oh, here we go from 21 to 29, 29, 29 to 39, 39, 59, and so on. So 141, if you scroll up, One of you, at least how many, I don't know, maybe also more. One person saw that it's given by just listing here in this line, you see the K-list is listed and you could have already guessed it directly there. So this line is still lying off once. So the um, 500 that we put in the top here is just the minimum contact length, con contact length. So we say every contact that is uh, shorter than this is uh, discarded because usually that is then meaningful. If it's just two read pairs or more or less overlapping, that doesn't really help us. So we usually provide, like, say, 500 base pairs is a, is a mean, meaningful cut. All right. Okay, the next step is something has to do something with ancient DNA damage. I already mentioned with mega hit and ancient DNA damage that it has the privilege uh, or the, the, the good thing about mega hit is that it can actually deal with ancient DNA data and damage compared to other samplers who completely fail. However, sometimes you have the problem or that it was, we realized together with a, in a collaboration with um, the PSI, Alpha's group in Vienna, where a few of his folks, um, a few of uh, um, for uh, answering to Marion. So one step back. The reason why we use the um, why we use not trimmed uh, why we use non-merged trees, but individual ones, is because. Uh, mega hit actually performs slightly better um, when you have the parent reads, even if the reads are very short and could be easily merged, because apparently it does internally some metric with the insert sizes that it can't do otherwise for the my audio is still broken. Yeah, it's still working. The connection is still working. Um, otherwise, maybe we put your audio on the screen and I talk over your, like on the speaker there. Yeah. Sorry about that. Wait a second. Yeah, I'm just trying to find my first. Okay. 
I mean, just here, just there. No, it's all Wi-Fi, don't worry. Okay. Uh, I think more or less it's not just nothing to do. It has nothing to do with um, my camera, like with the camera being on and off. It's just that my computer gets very warm because Carver Town is uh, not the most resource efficient program ever written. Sorry about that. So once more, um, regarding reads, paired and reads work better because of the mega hit, I think, in first insert size distribution from it directly, and therefore has a bit more power than if you had single end data. So I would recommend to always use paired end data, not single end data, if you have access to it. Only use single end data if necessary. Um, regarding the damage, uh, the Ancient, like I've already mentioned, that Megahit has a um, is able to work with ancient damage. However, there's also a caveat to it, and that is the case if you have a lot of ancient DNA image in your sample. Let's say you have a bacterium that has thirty percent, thirty percent of the C to T substitution as a five prime end, and then it might happen that actually Megahit gets confused in its internal setup. And on the right hand side here, you see. Um, let me find my cursor again. Now oh, here I am. The right hand side, you see a so-called deploying graph, um, a sample, uh, uh, the deploying graph representation of uh, three MERS, so the K-MERS size is three. And then this is more or less what internally the mega hit stores. And then based on this, it walks down the graph and reconstructs the sequence. However, if you now have a mismatch, like the sequence is identical, but in the middle we have a mismatch, in this case, SC to G in this example, for our case, more often C to T because of the ancient gene damage, Megahit is confronted with a problem, should I walk down the graph as it is, or should I use this extra bubble uh, turn and go around it? And what it does with the bubble is that um, sometimes it chooses to then say, oh, using this bubble is a better path than using the straight line, even if we know that this, in this case, C to G, but in our case, C to T substitution is actually a technical artifact. And so it turned out when we looked actually on the sequences and try to annotate proteins on it, um, gene sequences on it, that we realized that it's because of these weird C to T substitutions where we have only a T instead of a C, we have stop codons, missense mutations in the proteins. So thanks to my colleague Martin Klapper from the uh, from Stalpoth lab, we went back and implemented a pipeline that takes care of that. What we do there is that we um, align this short read data back to the context genotype like you heard this morning we genotype the um the context again based on the short read data and when we have see sufficient support that the majority of yield is different then what mega hits uh, reported then we replace the allele and you don't have to reinvent the wheel here and do it yourself but if you have uh, come into this problem then you can actually go into um the, like use the pipeline like NF Core Mac that um, James, Maxime, and to some part I helped to add the ancient DNA workflow to. It's already out there and it has all the steps for you, including all the mega hit steps, the binning steps, and so on that we talked at the moment about. So, next step. is that we want to assess the assembly quality. And sorry, I was too fast. One step back. And so the assembly quality, you can infer, like you have some of the information is already output by Megahit. I usually prefer to use a little script called um, caln50.gs that helps us um, do more summary statistic and more information. This program is usually not available on Conda, so therefore we go to our server and go to our command section and actually download the script. So we can go here, copy the URL. That was the wrong. 
Yeah, my computer is at the moment a bit slow, so apologies for that. Um, and then you go to the other terminal and paste it there. Press enter. That should download it. It's a very tiny script, but very efficient. And then we run it using the command that is just below it. And so here you get this output where there's an explanation of what is actually done there. So um, it's, you can provide the genome size, which we don't do. It's, it's not usually, it tells you the total sequence length, the number of sequences is in there. So here it says SZ is the number of total sequence, the number of sequences that were reported out there. And then you have this overview of uh, NL values, which is a N50, uh, um, like you know, might know N50 if you are familiar with it, which gives you N is the, um, the length of the like n so n is regarding the length uh, of the context and l is the number of contexts so what do i mean with it so in this case and the first line nl0 means the first the third column here is uh, 44 uh, 47950 it is the um, maximum length of the context that of any context you could find and because it's the longest contact, it is it's the first contact in the line. Now you order all the contacts that you have in your assembly by length. That's what the program did for us. And then you ask, okay, if I go, if I have to cover 10% um, of my, um, of the, all the contacts, like the first, the highest 10%, the first uh, decile, what is then the contact that overlaps the decile of the total contact length? In this case, it is, has a length of uh, 294,000 base pairs. And in total, we needed, uh, it's the fourth contact on the line. For 20%, if you go for a top 20, the, this, which, like this contact that overlaps the 20% line is, um, has a length of 205,000 and is the ninth contact on the line. So go through. 50% is the median usually. So that is a standard characteristic length. In this case, it's 15 points. 5 kb and we needed 103 contacts all of our length to reach the median if you then look to it that the bottom is 100 um, so here we have the 500 base pair minimum contact length so that is the same as we specified which means all we needed all of the contacts so if you compare the medium is we needed just 103 contacts to meet and reach one side of the middle and another um, 3,500 free for the other side of the middle. And so this together gives us an overview how well it works. And if you plot this, you get this kind of area under the curve um, value, which is a good metric to compare um, the statistic, which I now just cross jump across. So again, coming back to our questions, what you have now are supposed to do is to report to me what is the number of assembled contexts and their contact link. And I go to the next slide, if my computer lets me. I see that someone uh, sometimes gives me a bit of cryptic answers like contact count calculate from the contact number. Yes, that is a universal answer, but in this case, I would like to have um, the real numbers. Um, so um, that would be lovely. The majority of you 
seem to already have figured it out. Um, so the contact length is um, fairly simple. So it's more or less these two numbers. It's the number is Z that is here. So 11 megabases is what we can assemble. And um, the number of contacts is just listed below. So 3,606 contacts. Um, the area under the curve is something else. I don't want to go into details because we're running a bit late on time. Otherwise, I can, if someone really wants to know what is later, show it once more um, in, or it, like make it available later in the material. And um, for now, I would skip it. The second part of the question was the following. What is the maximum uh, contact length, the, me uh, the median contact length, and the minimum contact length? And again, here I would like to have the answers in there. And Give everyone still a chance for a drinking sip. I'm dying. Hope we're getting more. Yeah, it's two o'clock finally. Um, from the results, I see that most of you got it. I just double check once more. I don't really know where these two numbers come from, but um, interesting. More or less, you can do two things. Either you can directly take, go to the, um, the terminal to the third column and take the numbers from here, like this first row of NL, NL50 row and NL100 row. Or as someone also put it or put out, is if you go up to, sorry, scrolling too fast to the mega hit output actually at the bottom it's listed there as well, these four values that I asked for. All right, um, well done everyone. So Now that we actually assembled something, quick question is what do you want to do with it? You have now these contexts, you see that you have fairly long contexts through some of, like some of them are fairly long, many of them are short. So what can you do about it? And usually there's two different um, branches of how you can use them to investigate biological diversity. Here I present like the branch, like an example for each branch from a paper that Maxim and I together, like with our collaborators from Harvard, were able to, to work on last year. It's about paleofeces from the Americas. And our um, colleague, Marcia Rowe, who led the study, she constructed one end site based on these contexts. She annotated them, identified protein coding sequences, annotated these coding protein sequences with, using databases, and did then a gene catalog analysis asking are there genes present, absent, compared to comparative data. So that's one thing you could do with it. The other branch is you could try to reconstruct so-called metagenome assembled genomes and then use them as novel candidates for species and study the species diversity, which you will do tomorrow in some extent during your practical biogenetics in the morning. And today we will focus on this branch on the right hand side and only tackle like at the very end briefly the one on the left hand side. Okay. Um, before we continue with anything, there's a step that we have to run, which is the alignment against the context. I already mentioned to you before that um, we needed uh, this alignment step for multiple things. Um, in 
our case, the correction of the content, context sequences, if there's uh, uh, like miss uh, alleles called because of engineered damage, but also we'll need it for binning the max, uh, quantification of the presence of engineered data. And so therefore, the first step always is and afterwards after the novel assembly aligning back the sequences towards um, the data. Let me quickly. I have to restart my Firefox, otherwise I, I can't use my computer anymore. Sorry about that. They may have a problem with sharing the screen, so I will. Okay. Sorry for the hassle. Good sign, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try this again. Sorry about that. Okay, um, see if that looks better. Um, so first thing, we align all the data. And for this, we um, have to usually to run a lot of commands. So first we take create a folder for the alignment. We um, build the context into an index for bowtie. We run bowtie to align the reads against it. And then we do like we take the output and sort it. There is a number of steps, and as you see, the little card is there up on the right. Um, so we actually skip this step. If you already have the um, files download, like all on your server, which we have, no one complains. Um, reconnect. No one complains that we don't have the stuff there. We can just go to our uh, our document and copy the next lines of the commands and paste them into our terminal. And then if you do ls alignment, then you should see that there's these links present there. All right. I hope everyone has this now. I will move on. So before going diving into, I already mentioned this, this weird term, metagenome assembled genomes. What I mean with this is that um, at the moment, we are kind of in the stage on the left-hand side. We have this context, but we don't really know what they are. Are this from which bacteria are they? Are they viral? Are they from, from the human host or something? So what we then want to do is 
the so-called non-reference spinning of these contexts. And this non-reference spinning means that we don't take we don't take any kind of reference sequence for um, like as help, but we just more or less identify the nucleotide frequency of the um, of the uh, context sequences. So we quantify what this percent of A's, C's, G's, and T's, and the mean coverage along the context. And uh, then based on these two, we run multiple algorithms that then bring them and because the contexts look similar, they put it together. So for example, if one uh, context has an GC content of 30% and the coverage of 100 base pairs on average, the next one has a GC content of 30.02 and uh, a coverage of 101 fold, then very likely they belong together. Well, then a uh, genome, like a contact with a GC content of 60, but a coverage of 50 will very likely not fit. And there's specialized programs there that actually do the, um, does this for us. And then we end up with a suggestion of so-called metagenome assembled genomes or MACs. And in this case, hopefully for our other example, three of them, and also a bunch of re remaining contexts that can't be binned because they are just at a low frequency. There's not enough information to actually assign them to a bin. And that's what we're going to do. And there's a handful of um, binners out there that can do this um, for us. Uh, namely, the most common ones are usually MetaBed2, MaxBin2, and Concoct. But there's many more. And again, I can only recommend you, if you go into this, go to the Kami2 uh, challenge paper read the article, they have a longer list and also evaluated them on standardized data sets. We would now to have to prepare all the files and everything directly for the um, data set, uh, for the data set for every of these binners, but because there is luckily for us a program that is called MetaRef that allows us to conveniently run everything together in one program. MetaRef itself is a kind of a pipeline. It starts from the very beginning where you can process your reads, assemble them, bin them, do refinement or other shenanigans. I'm not the biggest fan of its pipeline. So I usually just cherry pick what I like about it and uh, to show you today how to do that. So first we have to prepare MetaRef actually to skip a few of these steps that we don't want to run like the assembly or the, the alignment steps because they will happen. And we have to do this bit of uh, bash foo, as the, the, the neckbeards are saying, of creating fake uh, uh, folders or, or folders, linking files, and creating empty files just to trick MetaRef not to do anything with us. And to do so, we go again to our command line, go a bit further down, do the pro next part, we highlight this part, and copy it over. and press enter. If we then look at what it did, we can just run ls metarep, and then we see that these two folders that we wanted to have created are created, initial binning and fox reads, so it looks like everything is good. Maria asked, do you still need to do max if you found the contact of a specific value interested in, in a metagenome example? No, you do not. Uh, I will also show you in a moment after the spinning how you directly annotate, like how you directly infer the, where, to which uh, taxonomic unit the contact belongs to. So you don't have to do per se the um, spinning and MAC reconstruction. However, if you have a very well preserved sample and you're looking at whole gene, like genomes and the evolution of genomes, um, then you should do the sampling as well, uh, the, the binning as well with the MAC reconstruction. All right, having done this, we can now go to actually bin it. And for this, we go in um, our terminal. The first step is we need another conda environment. And the reason for this is, to just be honest, MetaRep is one of the most horrible program pipelines out there. And one shouldn't even call it like this. And the, the software hasn't been updated in years. So it still uses old Python. So everything around it has to use old Python as well. 
So if you now run this command conda activate meta rep env, then on the left hand side again, meta rep env should be seen in the next line, which means it's active. And we can actually go further down and run the command. In the next step, we paste it and press enter. Then a lot of text comes um, where it runs different programs. So initially, it would try to do the sequence alignment, but since we already did it, it skips it. Then it runs first MetaBets 2 and then MaxBin 2, the two winners that we have. The third winner I mentioned, Concoct, we couldn't get installed with all everything that we wanted. So you skip it for the moment and we'll just discuss it in the next step and take it for granted. You see for this small sample, long, uh, little context, the pipeline runs in 34 seconds and you should have the same results. Like it should have a result um, line saying pi pipeline binning successfully finished. If we now look into what we got, and uh, then we can go to MetaRep, MetaRep, initial binning, 2, 6, 12, and do an LS. And you see that next to the work files folder that we created at the beginning, we now have two new folders, which is the MaxBin 2Bin and the MetaBet 2Bin. And now the question for you is, um, if you look into these two bins using, for example, an S, which of the two produced more bins? So if you go to our questions, which of the software has a higher number of produced bins? And please answer in the chat. Alex, Marilyn is asking, can you again repeat what MetaRap does? What is Bint? Okay, so MetaRap is um, more or less, it claims to be a Swiss Army knife where you give short read data in and you get a high quality max out. And it runs all the steps in between. It does the assembly for you, the sequence alignment step for you, it bins the steps for you and everything. What is Bint here is uh, we kind of skip the steps here. We start with the binning and we use as input the file of mega hits. I was a bit fast on this one and I go back on my slide for that. We did this linkings of the files here, the top part, Merlin. And the reason for this is um, I wanted not to let you align your own uh, alignments all by yourself. And these files have to be in sync. So I pre, pre prepared the assembly file. This is this FA file here. It's the context of MegaHit, just renamed. It's not the file, it's, it's identical to the final, con uh, final assemblies file that MegaHit produces. And based on this, I aligned all the short read data back so that these three samples are in sync. And this was um, bent in the end. So more or less. The things that you produced in this step, which is uh, was put as input, pre-prepared for me as input for you for binning here. So this is the binning step. All right. Um, sorry, I jumped from that. If I look at the answers. Um, I have nine answers. Um, is, do I only have uh, nine answers because the rest thinks it's too complicated, too warm, or something else? Are you lost still? Do you need more time? Um, So Marie uh, asked if we can blast the context 
Maria, we come to this in a moment, right after binning, I will be all with you for the last one. All right, suddenly 17 answers, that's where I'm, I'm waiting for. So yeah, the majority of the uh, people I correctly identified that MetaBet2 has more bins. Um, if we just look at these two folders here at the bottom, um, we have five bins for MaxBin2 and seven bins uh, for um, MetaBet2. MetaBet also gives you a few reasons why it, it discarded context. Um, so you have in total more files, but seven uh, contexts here. One of the reasons, or one of the questions, I additionally wanted to ask you is, if you uh, check the number of bins to bin size with each other, you can um, do it very conveniently. So if we go to um, in mass bin two. A to um, okay. Oh, sorry. We have to deactivate the Conda environment for that. Sorry, Conda deactivate. So we don't. After that yet, please run it, because we will not use MetaRef again. So it should be back to micro, microbial genomics on the left-hand side. What we can then do is actually look at the um, at the context sizes. And for this, we write this, um, what you might have seen, a for loop in Bash that just runs the same script, the scal and 50 script, and we just extract the line that starts with double uh, um, as Z for size. And if we run it, then we see the sizes of the five bins for MaxBin, which are 1.8 megabases, 1.6, 2.1, 1.9, 2.3, and so on. If I do the very same thing, but, sorry, for MetaBet2, And there go for bin. We see that if we compare the size to the seven bins of MetaBet, that on average the MetaBet bins are smaller. So it seems that MaxBin2, while it produces fewer bins, produces the longer ones. So um, in the, that's also, you always have to kind of say, is more bins better than fewer bins? It also bit, depends on the quality of the whole thing. So using this Cal and 50 tool, you can very efficiently query a lot of different tools without running more complicated programs like MetaQuest or something like this. All right, um, moving on. Usually now we saw that we have different number of um, bins available for either of the, um, right, the individual binners. And now MetaRef comes in handy again because it provides a so-called binning module. The binning module is available for um, the or bin refinement module. The bin refinement module actually takes the bins of the different uh, binners, individual binners. So it takes the five bins from max bin two the seven of MetaBet2 and tries to see if it can optimize these bins um, to get better context, uh, better max out of it. How does it do it? It actually um, looks for known single copy marker genes that are used for usually for lineage inference and says, oh, if you have a context that like two contexts that fall up put in the same bin, but one of them is assigned to lineage Prevotella and the other one to lineage I don't know, Clostridia, then it says that can't be the case. They have different lineages, so it splits the context into two different bins and cleans them up. And by this, if you look at the graph here on the right hand side, it improves um, the completion uh, percentage. That is one of the two major quality estimates and reduces the contamination. So in the top row, it's the higher you are and the further to the right you go, the better you are. And that is the best case here is always 
the solid red line, which is matter wrap. And on the bottom row, the contamination, you should be lower, so further low, and also again the first to the right, which in this case, again, is the red bar of matter wrap. Compared to the individual binners, this case meta bed, which is green, and max bin 2, which is purple, it definitely performs better because it's further up and to the right here for the com uh, completion and further low and to the right for the contamination. So why is this important, this completion and contamination? It's in 2017, there was a consortium um, put together a standardized checklist for how to report this max. And two of the next, so there's four different categories. So uh, finished, you can actually go to the table here in, in high quality. You have a finished Mac, uh, like finished uh, high quality trough genome, medium quality trough genome, or low quality trough genome. And while finished, we very likely will never get with ancient DNA because we would have then just one consecutive sequence. Uh, high quality trough genomes um, would indicate that next to having all the genes that are necessary, you have a completion of 90% and the contamination below 50, uh, uh, no, 5%, sorry. Medium trough genome, the completion is between 50% and 90% and the contamination below 10. And for low quality trough, you would have less than 50% completion, but at least also still contamination below 10%. We want to know like this is done using the program JAPM, and that is also used by uh, MetaRap. And we therefore want to now set up the bin refinement with MetaRap. And for this, again, you would have to install JAPM first. JAPM needs a database. The database is large, so we don't run it on our system, so we can skip this, thing, uh, this step. And also, we don't run the bin refinement ourselves here. I gave you the commands for both because it very likely would take the next two hours. So it's a very um, cumbersome iterative step that even for in a handful of bins takes quite a long time, which we don't really have here. So we will jump ahead and we will um, look at the output table. And for the output table, um, it's already part of your, um, part, uh, of your files. How can we look at tables efficiently at um, on the uh, terminal, this is a kind of a little pet project from uh, that I have um, of, that I would like to uh, distribute among people. There's a Python program that's called Visi Data, and it works like a table calculation program, so like Excel for the command line, and you can do most almost everything like Excel, including opening Excel files with different sheets and everything. And it's very easy to be installed. So if we go to our server, make sure again you are in this microbiogenomics folder like before we can um, go two steps out to the original folder. So where we have everything. And then we run pip install busy data. In my case, it's already installed. So it's nothing should happen for you. It should start installing the software um, in a moment. When you have it installed, you can use the fd command, or short for visit data, and open the MetaRap um, 50 bin stats file, like this. Press enter, and then you have the table nicely present in uh, your little table uh, calculation program. To navigate in this software, you can just use um, the arrow keys that brings you left, right, up and down if you want to scroll through rows. And the cool thing, for example, is that if you like, uh, it's a very complex program, you can do a lot of fancy stuff. I will show you a bit more in a moment. But a very simple thing, for example, is if you want the program to treat its column completeness as a decimal number, you press M, like the percent sign. Now on the like on the top, it's switched to the right. You see a little 
percent sign on the top that tells you it's now percent. And now you actually can sort it with the uh, bracket, uh, like square bracket keys, either ascendingly, if you lose the left one, or descendingly, uh, descending um, with the right bracket key. Same can be done for contamination, same thing with the percent sign and for the GC. If we go further to the right, lineage is a string column, so we don't have to do anything. The N50 is an integer number, so a non decimal number. And if you want to correctly format this one, you can use the hash sign, pound sign, however, depending on where you're from. And you have now the column format as well. So if you want to sort by N50, again, now it's not sorting uh, like as a string, but actually by numerical values. And you see that the highest N50 is for the Clostridium bin 4, the lowest one is for bin number 2. Size again, it's a non decimal number. So we use the hash sign and then we can sort and see that the size is um, uh, maximum size is 2.2 megabases, um, the lowest one, 1.5. I told you just a moment ago that the important part for um, scoring if a um, MAC is high or medium quality is the completion and the contamination. So if we look at this now, how many high quality genomes do we have? So that's the next question um, for your um, quiz. The answer is still trickling in, but uh, the strong winner so far is um, number 17. Uh, is it 17 answers that we're waiting for again? It's number C with two. Why is this the case? So if we look um, at the column completeness, we see that um, the first, there's two bins, bin four and bin three, that have a completeness above 90%. You need a completeness uh, above 90% to actually be a high quality MAC. The contamination has traditionally to be below 5%. All of our five bins have contamination below 1%, so contamination is not a problem. However, the other uh, three bins here have a, compl a completeness below um, the 90% and therefore would be scored as medium quality because they're above 50, but below 90 and we have two high quality max if we ignore the genes uh, presence of genes tests and so on to have you so the people who here click on c are the ones that are correct so now coming to maria's question so cool we have now max we have now the context but we don't actually know anything where they come from and yes that is a problem, and usually what we want to do is we want to classify them taxonomically. And there's two ways to do it. The first one is the context level, and for context level assignment, you could have skipped the whole part about the binning. That's not necessary. That you can run directly on the context. I personally still am more interested in most cases about having which genomes we could probably recover. That's why I always run the binning as well. But if you say that's not my cup of tea, all fine, you don't have to do that. You were right, Maria, you can blast them. You can use diamond for this as well. You can use Kraken 2, you can use centrifuge, Keiju, whatever you want to do. I personally prefer to use MMSeq 2 and uh, I'll tell you in a second. And you also can use to choose the database of interest you want. I know that uh, we talked in earlier with Nikolai before. Nikolai usually always uses NCBNT, but uh, NCBINT because 
that is has the largest resolution. Problem is you need also a lot of memory. Um, so it's and, and that's if you look at Scilife, make Nikolai, and you have a gigantic cluster that works out good or well. If you work on a tiny institute where you share your hardware, that might not work well. So it's always a bit of a of a gamble where you what you can do. Why I like MMSIG2 is it has a um, an approach that is very fast and still has a lot of sensitivity because it tries to annotate on the context protein sequences. And there's a protein sequence search um, against an optimized database and then has an LCA algorithm that has a high sensitivity while being relatively fast and runtime. And that's why I recommend to use it for you. However, as always, you have to first install a database without a database, nothing works. And in this case, the database needs alone 80 gigs and you need another 500 gigabytes of memory. It's still less than the one terabyte you really need for running uh, against the full NT database or two terabytes, um, but definitely also too much for most computers. So if you don't have the access to this kind of layout, I can recommend, for example, Kraken Unique, a new program that uses much less um, memory requirements to actually run on the samples. As you see the little card, I will skip the step because we will not have the resources to run it and also not the time. And also we will not um, actually run the MMC2 profiling of the context itself. However, we will look at the output table and the questions I have for you that you are supposed to answer in a moment is what are the dominant taxa you can find and what are the proportion of contexts that can be assigned to the ranked species, genus, etc. For this, we go all together over to the um, program, pressing a low, like lowercase q, finish, uh, like, uh, closes um, busy data, and we open the next busy data file, which is 2612.mm62.gdbt suite. So I hope that all of you now have this lovely table in front of them. In the bottom, you see that we classified uh, only 3,523 uh, 3, of the 3,603 contexts because for the rest, um, MNC2 didn't find any kind of markers to actually classify them, uh, I think, or they uh, were fell out because of different other reasons. For each context now, you have an um, NCBI text ID of where it's closest false to, which rank it was assigned to, because the LCA, like the, uh, those com uh, common uh, ancestor algorithm, places it further up a rank if you can align the, sequ like the sequence that you were, it was presented with is not species specific. Then we see the taxa name. Here comes a trick. If you want to see the whole column without it being cut off, you have to type an underscore underscore extends the column to the maximum width. If you want to reduce it again, you press underscore again, so underscore. And then we see here the different um, values. I usually look at uh, certain things. So here, it's the next step is the number of fragments it used. So how many of these fragments were identified? So for the first um, uh, contact, um, it found two fragments of which one was kept after quality filtering. This one could be assigned to the taxonomic unit. Therefore, the taxonomic agreement is 100%. In the second case, it was had found two fragments, but only one could be assigned. The other one was unassignable. So therefore, it has only a fraction agreement. So via this kind of metrics, you kind of get also idea how well it could classify the different contexts. The interesting part now comes on the right column, which is the so-called lineage. The lineage is the whole lineage where it gives you an idea where it falls, not just the name, but there you also can see, okay, if it was assigned to the species Bifidobacterium brevi, oh, this is the lineage of Bifidobacterium brevi. So your task now is what is a dominant um, taxa that you can find here in the list. You can scroll down the normal way just using the arrow keys. I think also um, page up and page down allow you to jump. 
Um, so have a look um, on the thing. All right, so I, I gave you a minute to look over the table. I think if you have to scroll through 3,523 rows, um, it's a bit cumbersome to really figure out what you have in front of it. So there's a few push metrics, as uh, our local IT person calls it, that I would like to share with you. So first of all, you can, of course, sort it. So if you sort it with the square bracket keys, uh, I would use the right one, because then you start actually seeing like it have a alphabetically reverse sorted. You see, okay, here we have one contact is Marinomonas arctica, then one to Enterobacteria uh, cerei family, and so on. And you get a bit better idea because then you see when there's a line of contacts all uh, showing the same lineage, then you can say, oh, here are five contacts assigned to the same lineage. However, that still is a bit complicated to eyeball. So here we can say, oh, there's Ruminococcus, but it's now Ruminococcus more often than. CAG488 uh, and so on is, is not that easy. So the next trick is, and please pay attention, is to press cap like shift lowercase f, which will produce you uh, a frequency table uh, here. So it tells you how often each uh, of the different uh, taxa lineages was actually assigned. And on the right-hand side, you see the count. If you would go further to the right, you also see the percent sign and the histogram, which we don't really need in the moment. Um, so my question now, based on this table, what are the predominant taxa that are found in the data set? What you can't see is James coming in from the outside at 36 degrees as a rather whitish uh, British person. Uh, was a jolly, jolly of you. Uh, so uh, everyone feel happy if you have air conditioning or don't have to go through a heat wave. Yeah, so uh, the first answers are trickling in. So based on the, I can tell you, um, like the roots were very low hanging. Once you have the histogram, which more or less tells you what you're supposed to find is, yeah, we have Rivatella in there. Um, we have Halococcus in there. We have Agatobacter in there, Colonciella in there. Sometimes um, we, for example, have also um, different parts of, like, for example, we have different parts of Bifidobacterium in here, like assigned to genus, assigned to long, like to species, long gone to another species, which also gives you the thing that if you like to come back to Maria's part, if you, it's very hard to infer from just the raw context what you really, unless you do a, like in, like in relative abundance profile, what you really have in there and what you, the likely species is. So having now shown this one and having gotten from most people, like if you press, continue to press lowercase q, get out of the program and seeing what the people have posted here slowly, which are actually the ones that I wanted to hear. I want to take 
a step further and to show you that actually if you would like to taxonomically classify the max itself you would not really go in this direction that you just you, or what you one thing you could do in an naive approach the the, the ha everything is a nail when you have a hammer approach um, approach would be just to take all the contexts that belong to uh, a mac and then say what is the most uh, common approach However, there's a tool out there that is not MMSeq2, but the so-called GTDB toolkit or short TK that has a slightly more sophisticated approach and that will uh, show you the results today. We will use it. Again, we can't run it, but we'll show you today. What it does is um, it uses the so-called single copy marker genes. Like I said before, they are, if you work with Max, they will be uh, um, everywhere, ubiquitous uh, across the um, analysis. And these are used then to identify the lineage of where your Mac falls. So if we, let me quickly jump back one step. If we go to the MetaRap table, here you see exactly this type of lineage where you say the lineage is eukaryota, proscridialis, helibacteria, CAI, lachmosperia, CAI, bacteria. And based on a similar type of algorithm, GTDK, identifies which lineage you are on, takes all the sequences that it knows belong to the lineage, builds a tree from that, like similar like the one that you have here on the right hand side, as six examples from their paper, and then takes the sequences of your contact from these marker genes and tries to place it in there. And based on this, it either assigns it out as an outgroup of something, as an outgroup of a subgroup, or actually as a, a sister like sister line of an genus here in this case. And with this, we can efficiently assign our max to something. Again, here, it needs a database. The database would uh, need uh, more uh, hard drive space than you have for your machines. So we skip this step. The commands are here. You can use them uh, later if you want to. We will also not run the paths here because we have no database installed and it would take too long. So we will look, go straight ahead and look at the two tables. And my question for you guys are, do you think this, first of all, do this classification match what we observed from the table just a moment ago from, that we got from the context? And secondly, does it make sense that we have these taxa present in the max given the archaeological context of the sample? For this, we go to the table and you can use um, BD again go to 12 GTDB and then ER Archaea or Bacteria, you get a small table where you get the classification. And if you scroll to like do an underscore, you see the whole thing. If your line is cut um, and you can't see it at all there, I don't know if you have what your size is, then um, you can also just open it in less. There's not uh, like less dots, capital S and Two six twelve GDP here, and you see the whole line. So, question for you guys: um, Actually, there's this one I skipped. I will show it in a moment. Um, is how do does do actually this this like the context match like max? the max classification match the context and is the background one that you expect. So we're running a bit low on time, so I'm jumping a bit ahead and to speed up because I really would like to go through everything that I want to present and that will be a bit challenging, but stay with me. So all of you all answered with yes. So for the majority of the taxa, if we compare it to, we have methanocrevibacter um, in there um, that I think was not the highest hit, but 
Helicobacterium morae was definitely in there. If we look at the other alternative um, bacteria, TSV, and look there, we have Agatobacter, which was mentioned by the, in the answers before. Brunococcus bromai was further down the line. You would have to scroll, like, I think, to the 50th line or something. And then you have the aforementioned the bacteria. bacterium. So yes, overall, the assignments are correct. However, some of them, for example, Prevotella, we couldn't find, which might be because it's just a background noise. I will talk about this at the very end in um, some more moments. This is actually expected from the archaeological context. Also here, yes, we would expect it. Four out of the five species are actually typical gut microbiome species you would expect from a paleopecia sample. And Halococcus uh, morae um, is actually uh, an archaea that lives in salt mines or in, in very salty environments. So if the sample is recovered from salt mine, it might just be that this bacterium from the soil migrated and grew on top of the paleopecia sample and therefore overgrew it partially. All right. So I have two more things that I will jump a bit, skip over a bit fast. Uh, apologize for that. Um, just to, I will walk you through it. You can take your time afterwards um, if you want in, in your time to um, go through it in a bit uh, less speed um, and recapitulate everything. What we usually also want to know is a contact ancient or not. And so, Maxime Bory, who you met already yesterday, wrote uh, a program to do this efficiently for context, where we can test whether or not um, automatically we had, uh, um, quantify the amount of C2T substitution into 5 prime end and test whether a null hypothesis model, which says there is no damage, is a better fit to the data than a model that assumes this logarithmic decay of if we observe for the damage. And in our case, we want to can use this program and run it on our um, BAM file, which then automatically for each contact gives you a table. You could do it yourself, but because we're a bit of short of time, I would jump straight to the terminal and open it for us. And Download it. And open it in LED. And if you, the, uh, the important columns at the moment, so are three of them. The very first one, the like predicted accuracy, which gives you an idea, the higher the value is, the more data was used to actually infer the models like the, the, the fit to the model and the, the Q value is based on. Then the Q value, which gives you an idea whether or not um, the damage model is better fit than the no model, which assumes no damage. So the, if the P value or Q value, the corrected P value, the Q value is um, below 0.05, then you have support for a damage model. And then you have still the C to T substitution um, rate frequency. Um, both of them are decimal numbers, so I can pre-format them by using the percent percent sign. And you see that the table is actually sorted by Q value. So the um, contexts that have the high support for being damaged have a Q are on the top and the bottom you don't have it. So if you look here, we have in total the all 3,606 contexts were profiled. We always see on the first page, so not, I think it's 25 contexts in total have a Q value of below 0.05, so we observe damage. All the other um, 3,581 have actually a Q value above, which supports that there's no damage. If you look at the damage itself, you also can easily see that the vast majority of uh, contexts have almost no damage at all at the term phase, so very quickly it falls back to below 3%. So coming to our question, which of these max do have damage? In fact, none of them has damage. So all of them have no damage. And this is kind of expected because we have so such a young sample in such good storage conditions, this long um, uh, DNA molecule length is uh, 
also showing you that this sample is borderline ancient, more of a modern sample, and behaves very much like a modern sample. So here in this case, ancient image can't help you identify if the species that you found is a true um, like non-contaminant uh, uh, species or like an environmental species or of the endogenous microbiome, but you have to make it from the context. Last step is what I didn't mention in the beginning is the other branch is the annotating of the genomes. And you can do it usually not just for all contexts, you can do it also in all contexts, you can also use on Max and there to kind of get an idea of which kind of genes are novel um, for each of the genomes which are present uh, there, are there the transfer and ribosomal RNAs, and is there uh, CRISPR sequences for CRISPR, uh, CRISPR cas analysis or something like this. And there's a program that you can run that is called Broca, which is uh, almost standard. And um, if you look at it, you um, again can run it. I um, realized yesterday evening, very late, sorry, this is the window. Um, that again, it doesn't work. So we have to download briefly the results. Uh, one, while I am downloading this now, um, one comment, a lot of these things need um, cond environments by themselves. So it's not very convenient to have everything installed in one or you have to always double check. So that's why I also would edit, like uh, encourage you to use pipelines to do it for you. This is the overall output of what could be found by Broca for this best preserved bin three, which is this methanoferic vector genome with 100% completeness. You see that we have almost 1800 um, coding sequences. We have 32 tRNAs, but if we go back to our table here, it says we have only a high quality genome if we have 23S RNA, 16S RNA, 5S RNA. And if we go back to our um, list here, there's not a single rRNA gene found. And that's not surprising. RNA gene, rRNA genes are very repetitive and they're very hard to assemble, particularly with cultural data. They recently also figured out if you have modern samples that don't have like long read sequencing technologies uh, like PacBio or uh, nanopore sequencing, it's almost impossible to resolve 16 sRNA genes. So technically, none of our genomes will likely be ever a uh, technically high quality genome because we will always, in this table setting, miss the part of that we have the sRNA genes, but we have nearly complete genomes, we usually phrase it now, because we, will not, we won't get, be able to have longer reads for that. All right, this brings me to end. I'm sorry I jumped a bit about over the pie image and the Broca results. Um, I hope you still, if you need time, you can always ask me questions afterwards or go through it a bit slower. What I hope we showed you today is how to de novo assemble short ancient read sequencing data, how you can then use the sequencing data, um, uh, like the context of the sequencing data, and perform non reference spinning if you're interested in it. We heard that some of you might think that is not necessary, um, that uh, you don't have to but we showed you how to do it based on nucleotide frequency and mean coverage. Um, we then also showed you that multiple binners give you different results and there's tools out there and there are, the numbers are growing if you follow them by archive. Every two weeks there's a new tool out there, how to refine them and also evaluate the quality of the bins based on single copy marker genes. We showed you how to taxonomically classify the, how the, both the context, but also the max against the GT database. You can also use the NCBI database. Uh, like Nikolai wrote in the chat, you just have to specify a tool in the database and download it for you. And finally, we also looked at the amount of ancient, how you can infer the amount of ancient DNA damage on the context level very efficiently. And I quickly brushed over how to annotate your genomes and how to learn from that. I have a cautionary note uh, as a second, like before James kicks me out in three minutes, I have, I think, two more minutes, um, is the sequencing depth. So today you had worked with a sample with three million DNA molecules and you got five max out with of which two were high quality. 
that usually barely ever happens. The reason for that was for educational purposes, as they say, I sub something non-randomly. I aligned the data, said I want to have this five max in there, pulled all the reads out, and then gave some additional noise to it. Usually, you would not get these results out. We have one sample in a paper that James was first over on, where we have nothing but one high quality MAC, um, but that's it. But usually, you need much more sequencing data. In this case, the original sample actually had, after adaptive filtering and removing human reads, almost 200 million reads to get this assembly. And we got, I think, 10 high quality genome uh, MACs out of it and, and 70 medium quality MACs. So, while you need a lot of sequencing in most cases, there's also special circumstances of the actual sample. That means some of them might just be very little complex. You have almost no genomes, then you don't need so much sequencing data, or they're ex exceptionally well preserved. So if they have, the longer the sequencing data is, the less sequencing data you need as well. Uh, the, the longer the sequencing reads are, the molecules are, the less data you need. So I would always say, give it a try. The worst thing, it can fail. Um, so if you have the resources, go for it. Um, and if you want to talk to your supervisor, more sequencing data usually helps. If they have like too much budget and ask, oh, what can we do at the end? Don't buy uh, some new primers or something, buy more sequencing data. And uh, just to closing, you can of course, or you should follow these steps at some point a bit by yourself and slower pace and time and do the analysis yourself. However, I personally would never run them all by hand, like hand, like I did now, but there's pipelines out there. One of them I can highly recommend is this Nextflow pipeline in it for Mac, which you see here in the tab that I open for you. Uh, James, uh, Maxime, and partially I have worked on that one. Um, it has a specialized module for um, Macs, and uh, therefore highly recommendable. It does the correction of the context for you for engineering damage. And finally, um, there's a tool suite called NVO, which has a lot of programs for manually walking through all the steps, visualizing things, and they have great tutorials. So even if I sometimes think it's a bit too much uh, taking you by the hand, I can highly recommend you for beginners. And also in some circumstances, I use it as well. Um, so, yeah. So Hakai asks, how applicable is this for Amoeba? In theory, it works as well. You just need different reference tools and everything. So if you have a reference database, you don't align against the bacterial one, of course, the Amoebas will not find any, you will not find Amoebas in there. If you align against a database that has eukaryotic markers in there, you can also align the, like, um, do the same analysis there. A lot of the tools are not optimized for it, but usually there's a workaround and there's specialized programs that I have not covered here today.